Let's push quickly. The people may argue till the end of days what, what the results mean, but they will actually get, get published. And so, you know, one key scientific objective will, will have occurred. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for Thank uh, bringing us up to date with Building One. <laughs> so our next presenter, uh, before we take a break for lunch, uh, is Dr. Neil Kalman. And I want to probably note that this may be the first time we've had a family physician present at uh, Advisory Council, although uh, others may correct me on the history there. Um, Neil's a board-certified family doc. Uh, he's president, CEO, and co-founder of the Institute for Family Health, and um, is currently, uh, since 1983, he's been uh, leading that institute uh, in uh, working in family health centers in the Bronx and Manhattan. Um, in 2012, he uh, created an affiliation between the Institute and Mount Sinai, where he became the professor and chair of the new Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, where he, he practices a, and has full clinical privileges for the family physicians in the uh, system in the seven affiliated hospitals. Um, and uh, he, we note that in 2017, family medicine was the second most selected specialty by graduating students uh, at uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Now, this is noteworthy because it's the Northeast, uh, because uh, in the West, this has been true for, for uh, several decades, um, and uh, where family medicine has had a strong presence in most uh, st usually state-driven uh, institutions uh, uh, west of the Mississippi. So. Uh, Neil's going to tell us about um, uh, uh, the structural racism in the healthcare system and an impact on healthcare disparities. So, uh, Neil, thanks. Thanks so much. Wow, what a great, uh, great set of presentations to have to follow. Um, so, what I, what I want to do um, in the next half hour is basically create, I guess, an environmental scan is the best way I can think about it to think about. What's going on in healthcare, both in terms of government, in terms of financing, um, in terms of regulatory issues? What's going on within our institutions? What's the milieu in which health disparities exist? Not so much focused, although I, I will talk a little bit about clinical decision making, but really more what's the environment look like? And I hope that I, there's at least a few things in here um, that some of you don't know. But uh, um, let me frame this by um, starting with this chart. So when the census came out, and I'd been working on health disparities for a few decades, um, I decided just to make a plot. And um, I think this was the reason why I was invited here, because I showed, showed you this slide when you came to visit us last year. So um, the, the, uh, you know, we plotted the ages of, of people um, in five-year intervals against uh, race. And what you see is um, in the under five years and um, in the younger age groups, you have about 67% of the population is white. By the time you get to 37 years, which is the average age of the U.S. population right now, um, it's up to almost 77% that's white. And by the time you hit age 65, where people are eligible for Medicare, um, it's over 83% of the population is white. And what this really represents in, in my mind, and I always start my lectures um, in medical school with this and a couple of other um, similar type slides, is it really represents the premature death of people of color um, in the United States and the whitening, what we call the whitening of America, the whitening of America with age. Um, and this has all kinds of implications. Another way to look at this is through these sort of survival curves, which are published. In, and, um, and here you just you start with like 100 patients, uh, 100 people um, of each of the race, race and ethnicities and genders. And you look at how many of them are still alive at various ages. And you see that for non-Hispanic black males, they start dying off at an early age and die off much more rapidly um, than any of the other groups. And interestingly, Hispanic females are the black line at the top um, who seem to do the best, at least in this particular um, representation of the data. But basically, again, supporting the fact that people of color are dying sooner and, um, than, than others. 
So another sort of phenomenon that you all know is that health, health outcomes across the country in almost everything are getting better, but disparities really aren't. And so no matter what you look at, life expectancy at birth, improving for everybody, but disparities are still there. Age adjusted death rates from heart disease going down for everybody, but disparities are still prominent. Um, you can look at, at procedures. These are, you know, preventive procedures, colorectal testing, colonoscopy. You know, the rates are going up across the country, but the disparities aren't really changing. And this is, uh, all, all cause cancer mortality. And if you look here, this, this is particularly interesting. The, the light blue, um, areas are 1990, 1975. And the darker area is 2006, about a 30-year difference. So you see in whites, the percentage surviving at five years went from 50% rough, 51% roughly to 67%, or a jump of about 17%. Well, the same thing happened with blacks. It went from 43% to 60%, a jump of about 17%. But then compare the 1975 data, and you see that there's a 7% difference between the 50 and the 43, um, and the same 7% difference still persists um, 30 years later. So again, we improve the cancer outcomes, the five-year survival rates, all cancers, and you can look at them all individually, um, but we haven't really done anything to improve on the disparities. And you can even look at the uninsurance rates if you want to see the same kind of parallel lines. Um, and the same thing happens with insurance. You know, when we, um, we've been doing a lot of work on getting more people insured. And again, more, more people are becoming insured across the country, but the disparities still exist in terms of, uh, the number, the, the people who are still, uh, most prevalently uninsured. So I want to talk about structural racism for a minute and what, th what this means. So basically, these are public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms that work in all kinds of ways to reinforce the perpet and perpetuate um, the racial group inequities. It's really what we're talking about is normalizing and legitimizing all of these historical, cultural, and institutional dynamics that advantage white people. This is what, what is commonly referred to now as white privilege. And all of this produces cumulative and chronic adverse inc outcomes for people of color. So structural racism really incorporates um, institutional racism, interpersonal, internalized racism. They all emerge from sort of this environment that we create. Um, oops. And so what I'm going to talk about is these various things. Um, and I'm going to do this briefly, but basically government inequities, inequities in the Medicare trust fund payments, inequities that are created by differential payments and systems for Medicare and Medicaid, the maldistribution of insurance by race and ethnicity. And then I'm going to move to the institutional piece, patients that are unequally distributed to hospitals because of their insurance, the inequitable burden that uninsured care puts on these institutions, differential treatment even within academic medical centers, and, uh, in and interesting findings now that came sort of um, that we've been experiencing in our own three residency programs around accreditation requirements and what this means about changing the complexion of the healthcare workforce. I'll talk um, for a moment about inherent bias then, specifically around surgery, and then to t I'll talk a little bit about an experiment that we did in our own organization to mitigate the effects of structural racism on patients with diabetes. So the trust fund, Medicare trust fund, interesting. So here's this, the curve I showed you before. And what I did here in this um, was I went to the tables that support these curves. And I assumed that basically the working age of people roughly between 25 years and 65 years. And so ask the question for people who are going to donate to the Medicaid trust fund, Medicare trust fund, sorry, to the Medicare trust fund throughout their working life, what are their odds of actually living to age 65? Because everybody's contributing to the trust fund equally. And you basically, you, you basically look at this and for white males, only 17.7% percent of them will not live to 65. Somewhere they will succumb before age 65. For blacks, it's 25.1 percent, or roughly a 42 percent greater chance that you won't make it to Medicare age 
if you're black than if you're white. And the same sort of relationship holds true um, for females. So what's the inequity here? People are contributing to the trust fund all through their working life, but certain people are much more, are much more likely to be advantaged by that and to get the advantage of it at age 65. Recall the chart that I showed you, the whitening of America and what happens by age 65. And so these are policy decisions that really affect sort of the environment of equity. And here was a paper that, um, that I found with actually had a recommendation. Those suffering from premature death, especially black males, they actually lose the chance to enjoy longevity in the coverage of Medicare. The solution might be a redistribution um, of, of the Medicare, a, a change in the Medicare enrollment age for different races and sexes or a differential Medicare tax, which is based upon population characteristics. A way of sort of taking up a, a government policy, which at its face is really unequitable, and making it equitable. So we also have a problem with differential payments between Medicare and Medicaid. So think about Medicare. They, you know, Medicare and Medicaid roughly came out within a, a year of each other, and Medicare has a totally different philosophy, right? It's a government program, federal government, and the federal government with some geographic adjustments sets rates for services that basically guarantee, um, or I won't say guarantee, but they facilitate the access for people um, to healthcare pretty much across the country. Medicaid is a state program. The state set Medicaid rates. And so the states can set those rates based upon, you know, local politics and local philosophy. And it doesn't guarantee that the same level of access for people because it's totally dependent on the politics of a particular state. So a fed both federally um, supported programs, both run out of the same federal agency, but with very different philosophical underpinnings where we value the care of older people, mostly, remember, um, people who are a predominantly white population, and, um, and Medicaid for people who are, are poorer. And what happened in the ACA was that there was a fee bump. Um, brilliantly, somebody said, hey, you know what, let's create, a, let's create a, um, a law where we have to basically get Medicaid to be paid at the same rate as Medicare. And that took place for two years and then it expired. And this is what the country looks like, basically, if you compare Medicaid rates with Medicare rates. And the darker states are those that have the, the least differentiation between Medicaid and Medicare. And I kept staring at this and staring at this and couldn't quite figure out why this was the way it was. And actually, what it is is that the darker states, because of their geographic um, adjustments to the Medicare payment have lower Medicare payments. And so actually the, the rates are, are closer together. But presumably, um, the, the, but, but then you have the, the lighter blue states. And in those states, the difference between Medicare and Medicaid rates can be as much as um, 60%. And so you end up with states where people who are on Medicaid, people who are poor, are being covered at a much lower rate and have much poorer access to care than the elderly. Again, um, not specifically a, a program that's, that creates racial and ethnic um, disparities, but one that clearly supports the, the inability of, of whole groups of people to get the care that they need. So, Across the states, if you look at the two little bars that I, that I made over there, um, you can see that for an office visit, there's a state that pays $20 for Medicaid, another state that pays $118. For in, and for hospital care, there's a state that pays 30 bucks and a state that pays $236 um, for the same service. Huge disparities across the country when you don't have a federal program that guarantees the same level um, of access for everybody. So we also maldistribute health insurance. Everybody knows this. Um, and so you see that, that if you're white, you have 72% chance of be having employer or other private insurance and only a 13% chance of being uninsured. And you can go down the list, but the Hispanic population faring the worst with 39% of people with private insurance and 32% uninsured. And so whenever you see something Whenever you see data that looks at the differentiation of care or access or anything by type of insurance, think 
race because these are all, anytime you discriminate based on type of insurance, you are also creating de facto racial discrimination. That's a key point because it's, it's the way that so much of the discrimination takes place within the healthcare system is we don't really, we no longer have the signs that say, you know, blacks can't drink out of this water fountain. What we have instead are, is a, a really clean differentiation of people based upon types of insurance in many institutions, which creates de facto segregation. And that is one of the reasons why um, we see so much disparity in access and in care. So um, I'm going to jump through a couple of these. So what we know that when you don't have insurance, it means that you are less likely to have a usual source of care. You postpone seeking care when it went because of cost, you, or you go without care because of cost, or you don't get your prescriptions filled. So all of these things are a result of, of not having um, adequate insurance. So in New York City, we have a, an increase an incredibly bizarre sort of system of care. And, um, and these, this is, a, I'm gonna take a minute to explain this, this chart. So each of these bars represents a hospital in New York City. The total height of the bar represents the percentage of their hospital discharges that are Medicaid and uninsured. And the little purple bar at the bottom is the percentage that's of a people who are discharged from the hospital um, who are uninsured. The bottom horizontal line is the percentage of uninsurance in New York City, roughly about 15.7% all, of all New York City folks are uninsured. So you can see across all of the hospitals, there's only one hospital that, that is contributing to the care of the uninsured at the rate that uninsured people exist in New York City. So just going across the whole system, you see that there's tremendous under service of people who are uninsured in New York City. You also can see the top bar of the top horizontal bar represents the percentage of people in New York City who are uninsured or on Medicaid. And you can see that there's only um, four hospitals without those little blue arrows. The blue arrows are public hospitals. There's only four hospitals of all the hospitals, the 63 hospitals in New York City. There's only four private hospitals that take care of a percentage of patients who are uninsured or on Medicaid, that is above the population rate of those two phenomena. So basically we have a whole hospital system, a whole private hospital system that underserves people who are poor and people, um, and people who are uninsured. So I what, tried to figure out like, well, who are those bad actors at the right side of this chart? And here's who they are. So it happens to include all five of the specialty hospitals. Calvary, which is the only hospital in New York City that's a dedicated hospice. Joint Disease and Hospital for Special Surgery that are the two dedicated orthopedic hospitals. Sloan Kettering, which is a dedicated cancer hospital. And NYU, which is a rehab, which is Rusk, which is a dedicated rehab hospital. So all the ones that are advertising on TV that, you know, if you want the best care in the world, come to us aren't really available to people who are poor and clearly not to people who are uninsured if you look at the, at the rates at the bottom. And so this is a hospital system that's supported like that. But more bizarrely, this is, these are hospitals that exist on the same block. This is a pairing of private and public hospitals and this was by design. So by design in New York, we put public hospitals and private hospitals right next door to each other. And in fact, some that weren't originally built that way like, Montef like Montefiore, Moses, and NCB on the left. Actually, the hospital was moved from the center of the Bronx right up to be next door to Montefiore some decades ago, actually um, in, in the mid-1970s. And what that enables the hospitals to do is to discriminate based on source of payment. So you can see the differentiation here with NCB being the public hospital, Monte Moses being the private hospital, the difference in the percentage of people on Medicaid and the uninsured. And these hospitals are connected floor by floor by a hallway, which has since been barred off. But when I was doing my residency there, we actually used to wheel people back and forth through that hallway, depending on the type of insurance they had. Um, Jacoby and Monty Weiler, which are basically on the same block, Bellevue and NYU, which are a block apart. Look at the disparities there. 
And then Mount Sinai, my own hospital, um, look at the Medicaid percentage that we serve. 22% Medicaid and uninsured when the population in Harlem is significantly higher and the two public hospitals that surround it, Harlem and Metropolitan, and the difference in the patients that are served there. So we've created these disparities that are based upon um, insurance and based upon um, that, but, but that create very different complexions of people going to the private hospitals and the public hospitals. Remember, this is the milieu in which we're training the next generation of doctors, right? We're training them in this, in this environment where it's okay. So we unequitably distribute the burden of care of the uninsured and subsidies. So this is my most recent research project. It actually extends all the way through three screens, if I could show it. Um, but this is putting together all of the data on the costs associated with care in these institutions, their own self-reported losses from Medicaid and, and the uninsured, and their subsidies that they get for taking care of folks. And so we've been working on this for a couple of years, and a very simplified sort of version of it is here. That line that I drew is a line that basically shows the amount of, of uninsured losses, which are on the x-axis on the bottom, and the amount that the hospitals collect from all of these pools. And the line represents the line where hospitals get back the exact same amount of money that they claim that they lost. And so there's a clustering around the line. But there's also a group of, of, of institutions that sort of fall off the line to the right. And after a bit of looking at this, I discovered there's really two lines. And the first line is the private hospitals that pretty much get back, for the most part, all the money that they lose in caring for the uninsured and Medicaid. So all of this sort of, quote, charitable work, which gets reimbursed from the pools. But the public hospitals are on the red line. And they, that line represents hospitals that lose, on average, $50 million a year each for each of the public hospitals in New York City that fall on that line. So not only have we created a system that inequitably distributes the uninsured to the public system so that they don't collect as much money, but we don't even subsidize them to the same extent. So they're not collecting back the dollars from the pools that they should in order to, to reimburse them. And so again, think inequities. What basically we're doing is we're taking the system that serves the poor, poorest people and we're underfunding it to the tune of losing money. And so that system, takes care of 68% of all uninsured discharges in the city. And so here's the result when you do that. So Mount Sinai saw 168% jump in, in its operating profits. They earned $108 million in operating income. NYU Langone earned $278.4 million from operations last year, and operating profits grew by 21.6%. And Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York basically said, what we're going to do is a combination of things to try and reduce what they estimate is a $1.4 billion debt in the public hospital system. And what they're going to do is we're going to have major cost reductions. We're going to have staffing reductions. We're going to do it by attrition and transfers because we have to bring the costs down quickly. So not only are we taking care of the poorest people, but we're going to have to do it at a discount from what we do now, which has already been cut while the private hospitals, which only make money because they can put all of the patients who are uninsured in the public system, um, lose money. So again, why do I bring this up? Because the, the, you know, we've been floating a public policy now, um, which I've been blatantly talking about in New York City, to say we should have an assessment on the private hospital system of a portion of the profits to fund the public hospitals. Why should we do that? Because as a public policy, we need a way not to have that kind of financial differentiation um, cause the kind of inequities that are causing people to get bad care. And uh, a researcher from Mount Sinai published this, this just this year, that the site of delivery contributes to black, white, severe maternal morbidity disparity. She basically said that if all of the women, uh, all of the black women um, in New York delivered in the same places that the white women did, we would reduce the morbidity, maternal morbidity by 47.7%. So that's huge. So 
We also have differential access to care, and this is something we've been studying for over 20 years. And I'm gonna take you back a moment, because I have a moment, um, to my medical school, um, 1974, Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago. This was the first time when I discovered what disparities in care really were about. Um, and remember, it's 1974, I'm making no comments about the current state of this medical center, which now looks like a spaceship for some of you who might have seen it in, in Chicago. Um, doesn't look like this anymore at all. Anyway, um, in 1974, I was a medical student there, a third year medical student, and I was on my OBGYN rotation. And literally what happened was um, one night the nurse, a nurse came to me and asked me if I would help her distribute medications. Now, as a third year medical student, I was the least qualified person in the institution to distribute medications. But over time, it became clear that the problem was actually a nursing shortage. And so medical students were routinely asked to come to the floor and help nurses distribute medications if there weren't enough nurses on the floor. And so what I did was what every um, sort of medical student would have done um, if they had grown up with a, in a family of social justice warriors like I had. Um, and I stole the nursing schedules off the floors of both the, the public floor, which was 7 Jones, and the private floor, which was 7 East. And basically looked at this to show that there, weren't, that, that, that there were um, many nursing shifts where there wasn't a single RN caring for 30 people in a public floor of uh, prenatal patients, many of whom were admitted because of, of severe problems um, prior to delivery. And most of the time, there were one to two RNs every shift on the private floor, which had a lower census and relatively healthier patients. And so, well, this was remarkable to me, and I thought I had discovered something terrific, and all I needed to do was go to the nursing office and tell them that this was what was happening. But of course, they knew, because this was inequality by design. This wasn't an accident. And I was basically told that we really shouldn't expect that people who are paying to, for their care at the hospital would be without a nurse, should I? And um, these are the kinds of things that go on today in institutions. We still hear the same complaints from people that are in floors that are mostly public patients versus these, sort of these elite floors that are built up. You know, where if you're short nurses for the day, where are you going to take them from? So discriminatory practices in healthcare settings, why do we worry about them? Because they're a setup for bad things to happen. So it's the same rotation I'm on, OBGYN, third year medical student. And one of the things I have to do is watch cesarean sections so I can see how they're done. And cesarean sections in those days were done under general anesthesia. And it was kind of a trick for the OBs. What they tried to do was get the babies out in two to three minutes. And the reason for that is because you put the mother to sleep, the anesthesia is going through the baby and the mother, and the babies come out floppy the longer it takes to deliver the baby. So it's the only time they would prep the mother, put the gowns on, do everything. Everybody would say, ready? Then they put the mask on the mother, they take a deep breath, she would go out, the surgeon would go like this, actually would go like, oops, like this, and the baby would be delivered in two to three minutes, and the surgeon would proudly stand up, usually a male, and say, how long was it? Two minutes and 35 seconds. Great. So I'm watching these cesarean sections, and the third one that I go to, they open up the, the mother like this, and the surgeon walks out off the operating table, walks to the back of the room and stands there with his arms folded. And another doctor comes up and starts drawing blood from uterine artery, uterine vein, takes seven or eight minutes, takes the blood from, the, from this patient, and then they go and deliver the baby. And then, of course, the baby by now has been anesthetized for eight or nine minutes, comes out floppy, needs oxygen, they slap it around a little bit. And for the most part, they're okay, but one of them ended up in the neonatal ICU. And a couple of my friends and I start talking about this, and we're wondering what the hell is going on, that these are all, of course, public patients, and this experiment is going on, this is 1974, is going on in the hospital. So I did what every good medical student who'd grown up in a social justice-involved um, family would do, and I went to the patients and I said, do you know what's going on? Um, this was after the surgery. Did, were, did anybody ask you if you would participate in a 
study or anything like that. And um, then I went to the library and put nickels in the copy machine and copied this anesthesia records to be able to show that this was actually happening. And went to, the, went to the chair of OB and said, you know, this is a terrible thing that you guys are doing. And he said, no, no, we've approved this, this, this uh, experiment. I said, but nobody really knows what's going on here. Oh, yes, they do. We talk to them all about it. They just don't remember. Um, and then I went to the dean of the medical school and the president of the medical center with one of my colleagues, and nothing was done. And so I went to my mentor um, and said, what the hell do we do? And he said, go to the newspapers. So the next day in the Chicago Defender, which is the black newspaper in Chicago, they basically um, published this, hospital tests on four women hit. And the following day, even though we'd, we'd originally called the Chicago Tribune, it was published in the Chicago Tribune. And of course, the medical center uh, fired the doctor because somebody needed to, to, to take the fall for this, but basically said that nothing had been done, nobody had been harmed. Um, and we had proof that they had. And so this, the, the reason I show this is because this information, and as we gather information about disparities, and as we gather in, information about the, the inequities in the system. Sometimes it's publishing it in the medical literature, but sometimes it's getting it out to the public to be able to show what's happening. And I'll come up with, and I'll show you another example of that in a minute. But basically we've been studying the disparities in care now in the outpatient systems of all the academic medical centers in New York. And they all run two systems of care. And I, now, and I know this, is, this happens in other places in the country, but not everywhere where they run clinics and faculty practices that are completely separate. So I get my care at the faculty practice, of course, because I have good insurance, but the clinic is where everybody on Medicaid, Medicaid managed care, and all of the uninsured patients get their care. And they're completely different in how they're organized. There's no after hours call. Patients are sent to the emergency room if you get your care in the clinic. If you get hospitalized, you may have been going to the cardiology clinic for five years, but if you get hospitalized, the cardiologist you've been seeing will not come to the hospital, but if you're in the private practice, they do. And so there's all these different, different aspects of care, and we still do this. This is happening today. A student um, that I was mentoring two years ago went and decided to do this study looking at access to specialty um, services in the institutions and found that in primary care, you know, uh, it took 20 days to get a clinic appointment, but three days to get a faculty practice appointment. In orthopedics, you could get a faculty practice appointment in seven days, but in the clinic, it took 77 days to get an orthopedic appointment. And she ran through all of the specialty clinics. Vascular surgery, 139 days to get a clinic appointment. So the average, you know, um, when we, the last time we studied this was like 70 days to get a clinic appointment with a specialist. Well, we looked at what, at what percentage of the people actually show up for their specialty appointments. And if you give somebody a specialty appointment within two days, 80% of the people, now remember, these are poor people and people who are uninsured and some of them are homeless, whatever, but 80% of them will show up for their specialty appointment if you give an appointment within two days. If you wait 30 days or more, which is far below what the average is for the waiting time, only 15% of the people show up for their specialty appointment. So we have a system that's really designed to keep people out, and that probably explains some of the reason you saw the disparities in access that I showed before. This is, I'm going to jump to a totally different topic, and this is one that's really affected our own program, um, and this is discrimination and acceptance to residency programs. And there are, and I just really found this out in the last couple of years, um, I found it out because I don't really run our three residency programs, but all of a sudden one of them was put on probation. And it was put on probation because of a failure of this standard. And the standard, which was just re-upped, says that you have to be above the fifth percentile in the percentage of your graduates who passed their specialty boards the first time around. So what this means is, that if you're looking to, to maintain your accreditation, you actually want to pick people who do really well on standardized tests. And we already know what bias that ends, that ends up putting into the system. I don't need to go into the data on that. So accreditation is dependent on first time board pass rates. So we get these applicants, um, a lot of them are people of color, they're people who've struggled, they're people who have gone, um, who have come through um, various, various routes of education. Some of them are older students, um, and some of them have trained overseas. But we, 
we accept people, especially in our Harlem program, who are really dedicated to serving that community. And a lot of them have taken these board exams once, twice, and even three times in past. But that's not what we're looking at in our program, but it is what's being looked at across the country. And how do we know that? Because this study showed that when the USMLE Step 1 scores are used to screen applicants for residency interviews, a significantly greater proportion of African-American students are going to be refused an interview. This is the entry point to get an interview into residency program. Somebody opens up the application. If it took you more than once to pass, they go like, wow, how do we know you're going to pass your specialty board first time around? That's going to be a ding against our program. We better take people who do good on standardized tests. And, um, and this survey, which is done biennially of program directors, this is actually done by the match. The factor most commonly cited for selecting candidates to interview were the USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 scores. So, so much for trying to diversify the people who are um, going into medicine. We have another sort of strike against us. I'm going to flash these by you, but this, I, you know, I did this really because I was so impressed that uh, NIMHD was doing this work on surgical disparities. The first thing that happened to me when I got to Mount Sinai in 2012 was I got a call from the chairman of surgery, said, can you come and do surgical grand rounds? And I said, what's a family doctor going to do at surgical grand rounds? He said, you're going to tell us about disparities in surgical care. And so literally, I used that famous um, healthcare research tool, Google, and I, in one night, I Googled, in one night, I Googled all of these things. So hospital factors and racial disparities for breast and colon cancer. And these are excerpts from, from the, the conclusions of these reports. Black patients compared to white had lower five-year overall survival rates after surgery for breast and colon cancer. Hospitals with large minority populations had the highest late mortality rates. Oops, what did I do? There we go. Um, Another on prostate cancer, black men were more likely to receive non-surgical treatment um, and to be of low socioeconomic status. Low socioeconomic status and non-surgical treatment are associated with greater risk of death amongst men with prostate cancer. Pancreas, black patients were as likely as white to show resectable disease, but were less likely to receive surgery, adjuvant or primary care chemotherapy and or radiation. Compared with Medicaid recipients, non-Medicaid Medicare enrollees were more likely to receive surgery, and the uninsured were less likely to receive adjuvant therapy. So we're basically discriminating in our choice of who gets surgery. And you can read all of these. And this is literally what I did at Surgical Grand Rounds. Esophageal cancer, rectal cancer, early stage lung cancer, even treatment for appendicitis before it ruptures. All of these things were related to socioeconomic status, um, the hospitals the, uh, that, they were, um, that they were delivered in, I mean, that the services were delivered in. So I'm going to end with this study, um, and this is something that we did at the Institute. Now, I've spent the better part of my life criticizing the rest of the healthcare system um, for being a major factor and, and government for its policies and being a major factor for why we are experiencing such disparities. Now, I'm not dumb enough to think that, that social determinants aren't the major factor here, but the piece that I can do something about as a physician is to try to highlight the fact that the healthcare system should be a place of refuge. It should be a place where we have eliminated the disparities in care and in treatment so that people who come to the healthcare system seek refuge there from all of the discrimination and other things that might be taking place in housing and everywhere else. But, um, and so we've been funded by the Center for Disease Control under the REACH program since 1999. And um, we, we were funded to look at disparities in um, heart disease. And, um, and, and diabetes in four zip codes in the Bronx with a population of 240,000 people. Um, so we got roughly $4 a person to do to change the outcomes of diabetes. But um, let me tell you what happened. So one night after we'd been on electronic health records for about four years, I woke up, I think I described this as a nightmare. And I thought, you know what? I've been, just, I've been criticizing the healthcare system. The way to really look at disparities is to look internally within our own system and then I can prove 
that there won't be any disparities in outcomes amongst our patients based on race, race and ethnicity. And so I asked the, our, our, um, our analysts to basically run a report for me on the most recent hemoglobin A1C, which is, which is basically a measure of people's most recent average blood sugar. And obviously, um, and the goal is actually at the, at the time when we did this, which was in uh, 2008 and 2009, was to get people below seven. Now we try to get them below eight. Um, but the average, the average um, A1C for whites was 7.03 in our, in our practices. And for blacks was 7.44. You can see the N is pretty large. Um, this is a group of community health centers. For Latinos, it was 7.86 and for Asians, 7.12. So we had disparities in outcomes, and the CDC was paying us roughly a million dollars to do this at a population level, but we couldn't even do it in our own practices. We couldn't even get people to the same outcomes in our own practices. So I was deeply, deeply troubled by this. Um, and we held a meeting of our group, and I said, oh my God, look at this. You know, we're going to be applying for uh, another award from the CDC to continue this program. And look what our own results show. It shows that we have disparities um, in health outcomes. So we tried to figure out what we were doing differently. We looked at 15 different things. I just picked out this chart because it's the only two things that we were doing differently for people of color than for whites. And that was they were being seen more often in the office and they were getting more medications prescribed for their diabetes both of which we thought should actually um, improve outcomes, but obviously was not. And then it occurred to us that maybe we were just a microcosm of the country as a whole, where people who come under our care all get better, but we don't eliminate the disparities. And so I asked the same analyst to please look for me at what the first hemoglobin A1C was that we had measured on every patient that we were caring for and what their most recent A1C was. And we had exactly the same thing going on in our practices. Everybody was getting better, but we weren't eliminating the disparities. And so we developed this concept that, was, that you know, to use a term that I don't love a lot, um, was sort of similar to affirmative action. We said this is like affirmative healthcare action. You can't do the same thing for everybody when people come in with a historical disadvantage, not only based on their socioeconomic status and other things, but also based upon the fact that there aren't that many pe places for people to get great care where they're not going to be discriminated on based upon um, their insurance. And, and their race. And so we basically, um, we looked at this and we implemented a set of um, interventions and we targeted it to the people who were over eight, to the people on the top of the, the left, people who were over eight, then reduced it to people who were over seven and a half in order to continue to improve. But we did all these things. We did a diabetes registry. But I think one of the more effective things is we actually um, gave diabetes disparities reports to each of the providers to show them within their own practice how their patients were doing of different races and ethnic groups. And how many, you know, of all the talk we do on disparities, there's almost nobody that I've come across that actually looks internally at their own practices or at the things that are going on in their own institutions and how people are being cared for. So we always use these big data sets of aggregated data from across the country. But unless we look at what we're doing in our own shop, we're not gonna really be able to fix this stuff. So we did all of these different interventions and we, de we developed this sort of graph thing that sort of comes out of the system automatically not very sophisticated, but what you can see is over time from January 09 to November 15th, when we sort of ended this, this project, this, this um, project, that the disparities in people whose A1Cs were over nine sort of diminished and pretty much went away. Um, and the disparities in people who um, got their A1Cs below seven pretty much went away. And almost everybody uh, really reached our goal at that point. And so what we were doing was basically targeting people with historical disadvantage who came in with the worst um, hemoglobin A1C scores, and we were basically doing extra things for them. We were doing extra outreach, and we were bringing them into diabetes management groups and other things like that. And this is across thousands of patients, right, uh, almost 5,000 total um, uh, diabetes patients. Same thing with A1Cs less than eight. 
these were people, this was the disparities in nephrology in, in um, nephrology screening, basically screening for kidney disease, for protein in the urine. And you can see that we reached our goal and the disparities went away. But this was blood pressure. We did nothing. It didn't, it didn't fix anything in blood pressure. And the reason for that is because the whole project, this almost became our control group. The whole project literally was focused on people's blood sugars. And of course, right in the middle of this was when everybody started talking about how it was more important to control blood pressure than, than blood sugar in diabetics, so we were a little embarrassed. But this, um, this really did, it really showed that what we, you could focus energy on a particular problem. And in spite of the fact that some of our patients were homeless, in spite of the fact that many of them had been out of treatment for years, that with extra effort, you could actually do more. And think about how sad this is. We can't even get people the same treatment in the systems that we currently are part of, let alone try to convince people that folks with this historical disadvantage need more um, treatment. So I just th this actually picks up well on the pre previous speaker. We thought we would publish this information, which we eventually did in, um, in the medical literature. But I was much more interested in publishing it in a monograph that we could give thousands of copies out and put out on CD and put online in order to be able to get the information that we had done about the disparities in care out to the public. And so we put out this monograph and we also did something else. We filed a complaint with a New York State Attorney General claiming that these kinds of discriminatory practices, though they weren't specifically targeted by race, because they separated people based on insurance and insurance was so closely um, linked to race that they provided de facto discrimination based on race and that these systems needed to create um, equal care. And so again, this was picked up in the newspapers. There was a lot of flurry. We did a, a, a three-part show with Sanjay Gupta on television um, on racial discrimination and racial disparities. Um, and all of that stuff brought to highlight the fact that this was happening in our community and really has made a major um, impact. Of course, we haven't cured this problem. Um, it's going to be decades. But I can tell you that a lot of there's a lot of talk, even in our own institution. Now we have two new committees at the institutional level that are focused on eliminating the disparities in care between the clinic system and the private system. Are they talking about combining them into one system of care? Only in cases where it made sense economically, but basically eliminating the disparities in care in treatment in the two systems is a, a first step. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a group of 500 people that we brought to Albany. Um, we did this in order to highlight for our legislature the, the ways in which people who are poor in the Bronx are cared for in a, in a way that's not the same as everybody else. And um, I just want to, I'll end with this slide, which is basically a few thoughts about where we're headed with our future research. So we need to know if this sort of affirmative healthcare action can create equity in health outcomes, even if you have people that come in with social justice, social inequities, and, and we're screening most of them now for social determinants of health. The question is, can we sort of, is our, should our responsibility be now to deal with the social determinants of health with the housing issues? And we, we have, have hired over 200 care managers to help people through all of those issues. But shouldn't we at the same time be doing something on a clinical level to really try to get people to achieve the same health outcomes? Second, we need to we need methods to differentiate, differentiate between bias and decision making. I specifically think about this in relationship to surgery and some of the things around cancer chemotherapy. Are these, are these, are these decisions that are being made result of inherent bias by the surgeons, by the, the people working in the cancer centers, or are there economic and other impediments that are really um, 
forcing the same kinds of decisions or even patient choice um, issues. We need to study the effect of documenting inequities on effectuating policy change. How do we document these things? Is it by publishing them in the medical literature? Is it by bringing them to the newspapers? Is it by meeting with legislators? How do we actually take the things that we know and turn it into um, the, the, the food for social change? And we finally need to understand the relationship between the funding of our healthcare institutions and their quality performance. Because as long as we allow them to differentiate in who they take care of, their economic state is going to be incredibly different. And the quality of care may turn out to be very different as well. And we're now sort of looking at the economic performance of the hospitals in New York versus some of the uh, publicly reported quality um, metrics. And all of this is in the hopes of making healthy quality a reality. Thank you. Wow, I ate half of your lunch. Um, so we are running a little bit behind. Uh, are you going to stay around, Neil? Yeah, I'll be here all day. Okay. Uh, maybe wanna... if anybody has one comment, uh, question, uh, Sandro? 